This week, we go to some of the extremes to learn from trauma with Dr. Anne O'Neill, founder of Angel Hands, a non-for-profit provider of support and assistance to help people recover from extreme trauma. In 1994, Anne survived the murder of her two children by her estranged husband, who also shot her before turning the gun upon himself. Anne shares how her own self-navigated road to recovery in a pre-internet age led her to her studies that led to her doctorate and the creation of Angel Hands to help others that have been thrust into a similar situation. Anne explains how, when exposed to traumatic events, some will flail, some will survive, and some will thrive. And it's from this that she shares her empowering hope model of traumatic recovery. We also discussed such themes as being okay with not being okay, the impact of choosing your own self-identity labels, the pitfalls of over-focusing on the why, the prevalence of domestic violence and familicide, and how there's a big need for better models and case studies for post-separation and co-parenting. While this may well seem like a heavy topic, and it would be easy to get stuck on what has happened to Anne herself, Anne is very inspiring to listen to, and her sense of humour is infectious. It doesn't take exposure to extreme trauma to take away and apply her messages and learnings to be all you can be. So enjoy, Anne. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Dealing and learning from trauma in its most extreme form is where we're going today with my guest, Dr. Anne O'Neill. Anne, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? Very well. So, Anne, uh, one of the questions I always ask my guests at the start, because it's WA Real, is um, you were born in WA. I was. Indeed. So tell me, what was it like growing up here? Oh, look, WA is a fabulous place to grow up. I grew up mainly out in the wheat belt, so uh, lots of open spaces and uh, wonderful adventures into the, the bush and the farm and all of that was great. Yeah. Are you uh, a proud West Aussie? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got such a rich, huge state with almost every type of uh, climate you could wish for. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's awesome. Um, given um, like your story and what we dig into, have you ever thought about leaving? Uh, look, I think there have been moments where, you know, it would be nice to, to live abroad for a while, but uh, no, WA no. will always be home. Excellent, excellent. So you're the patron and founder of Angel Hands, which is a non-for-profit that provides um, support and assistance to people who've been on the receiving end of uh, extreme sort of violent cases and things. Um, can you tell me more about it and, and the service it provides and how that fits in? Okay, it's it's quite a, a difficult uh, role to squash into a really easy description, but essentially yeah. we help people on their journey to trauma recovery, yes. and we help them by talking with them, sharing techs, uh, techniques and tools so that they can master any trauma symptoms that they're experiencing, yeah. so that those symptoms don't master them. Right. So it's some counselling, some activities, some referrals, um, education and awareness. Yeah. And, uh, so it's not just the standard two people in a room with a chair no. talking. <laughs> no. We do yeah. do some of yeah, that yeah. and we That's do some group work. We do retreats when we have funding mm. available. and But a lot of what we do is what we call therapeutic work as opposed to clinical. So we don't yeah. sit down and diagnose people and yeah. and that like a psychologist or, or someone might. What we do is a lot of therapeutic uh, I, I like to think of it as if, if you think of trauma as another country. Yep. Somebody's picked you up and dumped you onto this foreign landscape of trauma. Right. You don't know the language, you don't know the landmarks, you don't really understand yeah. even how you got there because it wasn't the pathway you were on. So we're sort of tour guides to help you understand the landmarks, to negotiate the hiccups that you're experiencing in them, you know, get up the hill that you're struggling with. Yeah, and just so we're clear, what sort of traumatic events do you generally deal with? Look, we deal with all sorts of trauma from sort of, uh, we, we have people come after road trauma, you know, trauma involving suicide, but we also, our, our main group of people are people who've been traumatised through violence, either, yeah. you know, an abuse, either historical or current and more recent. Yeah. So particularly, we started as being specific to homicide, but more and more people asked um, 
you know, can can we help? Can we help? Can we help yeah. them? So we've you know got everything from domestic violence all the way through to you know perhaps somebody who's had a a burglary or a home invasion, mm. motor vehicle accident. So, at, at what point do you get involved, and how do you get called mm. in, as it were? Look, people predominantly uh, self-refer or are referred through agencies, so they don't quite fit anywhere else and and they get sent to us we typically don't get involved at the point of a crisis unless people come to us and say look right, this so just happened the point in time. yeah so we we typically are you know anywhere from 6 to 32 33 years later so right. um, we're we're anywhere in that space okay. we try to connect people to existing crisis you know at that point where something happens we try to you know, uh, connect them with those services because, of course, they have more resources and and the, yes. the up to date information about that. But if that's not working, then we can help as right. well. And and so you you'll continue working with someone forever. Today. We we talk forever. about being part of the Angel Hands family. Yeah, you can come for as long as you you need to, and you can disappear, and then you can come come back back a couple of years later if something happens, because trauma recovery is very much a life stage process. So, you know, you get get used to the initial sort of experience and you learn to hold that and carry that and then something in life changes it might be another loss it might be you know uh, people around you their their children are getting married and and you know having babies and your child didn't get to grow up and didn't get to you know get married or have babies so you often have to reprocess how you make meaning of that traumatic experience so whenever people need to come back we always welcome them back to our Angel Hands family. I have to ask, where does the name Angel Hands come from? Well, we, uh, when we first started, a, a group of us on our, what we call a management committee, because we were all people affected by trauma who, yes. you know, wanted to do something to make a difference. And we sat around and everybody talked about angels, be they earthly or heavenly angels who had helped them. And, and when we brainstormed away around what, what signified help were, were hands, you know, you reach out a hand, you give someone a hand, you lend a hand. So we put those two words together and came up with angel hands. Right. And, uh, a lot of people think we're religious, but we're not. No. Uh, we, we, um, we don't mind. We, we actually do a lot of therapeutic work that involves spirituality and people's sense of faith, but we ourselves are a non-religious mm. organisation. Yes, no, I can imagine this many of those events would cause you to ask such bigger questions it often challenges people's faith or it strengthens it it, it depends it can be quite a diverse response yeah now just to set the context obviously you said there's um yourself and the members on the the, the, the management committee yeah have all sort of encountered an event in their life can you just well, since then, we've yeah. developed a long way. So we've gone from, from an interest group with a management committee all the way yeah. through where we're now uh, driven by a board of directors, yeah. you know, or led, I should say, by a board of directors who um, don't necessarily have a traumatic experience. But yes. if we think that, you know, the research says 50 to 75%, so if we take the middle and say two-thirds of people are likely to have experienced trauma in their their life then yes. there's a high likelihood that they've got some experience of yeah. trauma as well even to if they don't pole. name it yeah, yeah. absolutely and, and just for my just for my listeners can you give us an overview of your experience of why you ended up becoming Oh gosh. Well, I uh, I was introduced to you know I guess the the world of extreme trauma. Um, you know. I love the word introduced because <laughs> I know what's coming. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Through and the word tour guide you yeah. used earlier on. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't something, I, you know, anyone goes out and looks for. So it, way back in 94, I had an experience in which my children's lives were taken and there was an attempt on my life by their father, my estranged husband, who then uh, completed a suicide. And it was a whole new way of living and, you know, I often joke and say I lost my right leg. If you happen to have seen it, can anybody out there let me know because I'm still <laughs> looking for it, you know. But it's it, really, careless, it, it was, it was. Uh, uh, the euphemisms we use about yes. loss, you know. Uh, but anyway, it, it was a new world and, and uh, 
it was no one really knew what to do. I was in hospital for for the medical reasons for a long time, but because of the lag, yeah. And people there tried to help. They were, you know, very caring, but nobody really knew. And and I quickly worked out that it's not very often that someone survives a familicide when there's attempt on their life as mm. well. So I was sort of this strange person that well. What, what do we do? And then as time went on, I went home, I went to the library, I couldn't find anything in the library specific to what do you do after a homicide, let alone a multiple homicide. And uh, then I started talking to people and reading more and there was lots about suicide or illness or sudden death through a car This is accident. pre-internet as well, isn't it? This is pre-internet, so internet You've not got didn't... chat groups or anything? No, nothing like that. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, there were very limited amount of books. There was the occasional reference to homicide or there were great big glossy autobiographies of people who had thrived after trauma. And uh, most of them were American. So there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't a lot I could relate to. And, you know, I, I got asked to do a presentation to, to a group in, in WA on domestic violence. I went along and I realised there that there was this huge thirst. You know, people were were just bursting to know how to prevent these things and how to respond afterwards. Prevent. And like, you yeah. know, a familicide, the killing yeah. of one's family, or even domestic homicide and domestic violence. You know, they really yes. wanted to, to know how do we prevent this and then what do we do afterwards? How do we pe- yeah. help when people? Yeah, it does occur. Yeah, what, do you do? what do we do? So I, and I, at the time, you know, I'd left school at 15. I obviously, you know, I felt like I didn't make very wise choices. So, you know, what could I possibly know to tell all these professional people? Mm. So I set about learning, went and did a social work degree and while I was doing that the Homicide Victim Support Group in WA was formed which I ended up chairing Um, and it was through that experience that I I learned there was a lot of commonality but there was also sort of, uh, I I say the 80-20, 80% of a trauma experience you'll have similar symptoms but the 20% of nuance in how you, you know what landmarks you come across, what mm. potholes you fall into, which buildings you need to drop past, and you know experience the inner workings of yeah. vary. So, and I realised it wasn't just because of the, I guess, oh, I'd like to say unusual, but the the limited amount of people who actually experience um, familicide. I found that even in cases where there was only one person lost and where it would be, you know, I guess something quite stereotypical in the media Mm. (laughs) that we see happening. I don't like to say a stereotypical experience, but, you know, Mm. there was so much systemic re-victimisation of people. So criminal injuries compensation is designed to help you, but often it's not accessible. And in those times it was even less accessible I mean we've just seen some great initiative by the WA government that anyone can access eight thousand dollars for the funeral straight away yes whereas way back then you know there was nothing there wasn't even crime scene cleaning there you know you, you didn't necessarily have a police officer that knew how to respond to you or was trained in anything so you know we've made lots and lots of changes but it were those sorts of things that led me to to really want to understand more and to do my first piece of research as a um, a book that anyone could pick up who'd had an experience of homicide yes. and read so they knew that they were normal, like, you know, right. there was this diversity. Within, within this yeah. strange landscape exactly. now in, exactly. they are normal. Normal, and, and one of the first things we say to people after a trauma is how your you know, feeling is normal after an abnormal experience. Yes. So we help them to realise that they actually don't have two heads and they're not going crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Most people who've gone through what they've gone through would have very similar, you know, experiences. Perhaps not exactly the same, but very similar. So that was the first step of of normalising and having something... Uh, that people anywhere could read. Yes. And the internet at that stage had just started to, to blossom into most people's lounge rooms. Yes. It had become accessible. And uh, it was an award for that piece of research that um, 
I had said I would use the funds. I think it was about two thousand dollars for the Grace Vaughan Award, and I yeah. said I'd use those funds to disseminate my research to people yeah. who needed it. Why should it sit in a book? Yeah, and some somebody said, "Well, why don't you put it on the internet?" And I'm like, mm, "I don't know much about internet or computer." So yeah. I went off and and spoke to a friend of mine, John Burrell, who co-founded Angel Hands, and we decided we'd start this website. And we wouldn't just put my research on it, we'd put a whole lot of information because mm. if you typed in victim of homicide, you'd get all these gruesome pictures of crime scenes. Yeah, which is not what you want. No. So thus, Angel Hands was born as a static mm. information site for people and a referral source. So, And that was in 2001. Early and, dog time. Yeah. So, and then I went on to do my PhD. And, yeah. Um, Has the... Um, and what, We'll jump into the study. Has the study been part of your healing process as well? Uh, look, I, th I certainly think it helps you to understand, you know, you make meaning of your own experience. Yes. And uh, a lot of people, you know, will hear me talk of my hope model of trauma recovery. Yeah. And uh, within that, the P stands for the pilgrim, the pilgrim in all of us that has to go on that quest in this foreign landscape and and learn to make meaning and, and, and learn how to understand, yes. you know, where they are and, and how they can sort of, you know, sit with something and go, well, I might not like it, but I can hold it and I can yes. put it there and know it's there without struggling, you know, and fighting with it it's every okay day. Yeah. Not to be okay. Exactly. And and why would you be okay after something like this exactly. happened? You know, I think and, and that was an interesting thing that when I, I talked to people there was this uh there's a tension between being okay and having lost someone full stop, yes. let alone through such traumatic circumstances that none of us expect, in that who wants to be inspirational for surviving the loss of a loved one? What does that say about how much you love them? You know, are you a crap parent because you're doing all right without them? You know, like yeah. there's all, all that it's stuff. It's very conflicting. It is. It's very deep. And, and a yeah. lot of people struggle to, you know, hold that. Yeah, yeah, because you've got all these different conflicting things. I mean, even just... It's okay to not be okay and recognise I'm, I'm in an abnormal landscape, but at the same time, surely you can't wallow in that, otherwise you're breathing extra oxygen into a fire you don't necessarily want to feed. So yep. you can recognise it, but at the same time, oh, I recognise I'm here, but I also want to be over there as well. It is. It's a, a real tension a real between... Labyrinth. Yeah, and yeah. everyone says, oh, if something happened to my kids, I'd, I'd just want to die. So what does it mean if you're not suicidal? Does that mean you didn't love your kids? Yeah. You know, like we've got all these internal social messages about how grief yeah. should be and what it should look like. And all these deep-seated beliefs that you have about what you should and shouldn't be doing, which you've picked up from your childhood and your significant people that are role model in your life, and they all just... It's, I imagine this experience just... Boom. Oh, yeah. Pulls them all up to the top. Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of people feel like they're living in a goldfish bowl. You know, um, I used to say, you know, if I went out to a function and I drank, oh, she's drinking too much. If I didn't drink, oh, she's not drinking, she's a bit withdrawn, you know. Yeah. If, I, if I had a... It's loose, loose. If I was dating, oh, she's been promiscuous. If I wasn't yeah. dating, oh, she hates men, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. There was this real life. Oh, she's moved on too quick. Yeah. Oh, she's been a dusty spinster. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so there were all these you yeah. know, polar opposites yeah. that people would interpret. When really all of that is actually just going on up in here, really. Oh, no. Is it? Oh, well. <laughs> I think sometimes people do make those. No, you're right, you're right. I'll take that back. But it's whether you choose to listen to it. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's hard yeah. not to when you don't know. I mean, my first piece yeah. of research was called Honouring Survival. Is there mm. a rule book? Because what are the rules, you know? Yeah. Who writes them? What, how are we supposed to play this game if, if you put it in that, you know, yeah. crass term? Yeah. So um, I'm really keen to know more about your understanding of trauma as a model and the recovery because one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you was because throughout all of my um, podcasts, I start to see different patterns in certain things. And whilst the... The con and some of my listeners actually get in touch with me and they're like, I, well, the content is different. The context is mm -hmm. the same in some of them. and They're not all the same, but they're starting to see patterns. I see patterns, some of the listeners see patterns. So you, through your own experience and through the work you do with Angel Hands, etc., and your studies, 
you, surely you will see patterns and underlying framework in trauma and the road to recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you could share that. Well, the, the, I guess there's two parts to what I've really, I guess, crystallised in my thinking. And one is the, the sort of the map, the 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 landscape of trauma. So I've, yes. I've developed a, a graphic, a, um, you know, with the help of, of uh, one of our team here, we sat down and brainstormed out, you know, what does this journey look like? You know, you're going along, something happens, you know, and mm. and, 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 and even uh, most of us don't think about it, but things like cyberbullying can, can cause trauma, mm. you know, school bullying. It's, mm. it's really, uh, we think of trauma as this big in your face thing, but yes. it, it can come from a number of um, different places. And really uh, the, the literature talks about the three E's of trauma. So it's an event or a series of events and circumstances. So the event is, you know, the first E. The second E is that they're experienced you know, to be harmful or, or threatening. Either That's just your interpretation of that event. Absolutely. Yes. So we could sit here and watch the same thing and one of us experience it as potentially or actually hurtful and harmful yeah. and the other one may not. So, yeah. it, so it is the experience of the event and that those events have, you know, a lasting effect on well-being and, and psychological, um, you know, uh, what would you say the adverse um, well-being and function yes. outcomes? So whether that be your health, your your sort of way you socialise, the way you feel about the world, those sorts of things. So those are the three E's of a traumatic experience. And uh, there's really three phases. I, I feel like I've got threes everywhere in this now. I'm saying it out aloud. Yeah. <laughs> but there's that first crisis sort of ripple, which lasts yep. for about a month. Everybody zooms it's in. And I do. Yes. And and if you think of that point at that first um, part, you know, it's it's like in a, a TV show. Everyone's there. Fumph, you know, the police are doing their work. Yeah, the yeah. counsellors are in. The family's in making dinner and doing. And there's all Everything's, this activity. And yeah. that, that's that first ripple of the crisis. Then people sort of start to back off. They've done their, their bit. And, and then there's the second ripple, which is usually where there's systemic involvement. You might be seeing a doctor, a counsellor, that courts might be involved. You might have the EAP, EAP Employee Assistance yep. Program at work, those sorts of things. Uh, and your close friends might stay a bit closer. Um, but then that third ripple is sort of... 12 to 18 months later, people are going back to their own life. You should be over it now. Yeah, you, know, you should, should be over yeah, it. Yeah, you know, and you should be recovered. Yes. Um, be now, right <laughs> often if there's criminal proceedings, mm. they haven't even started. Yeah. But in the, the general world of how we expect people to recover, if you've not at least semi-packed up your crab and shoved it back in, in your suitcase after, you know, three months, yes. uh, we're sending you off for some help. Yes. You know, get it together. Just so not getting on with it. Exactly. Mm. And, and what we know is it actually takes a lot longer. And about a third of people will actually be okay. They'll, yep. they'll, they'll keep their nose above the water and, and they'll go back to work, they'll function we have no data on whether they would reach the same potential as they would have hmm. had it not been yeah, for well, the how, event. How do you, how do you Yeah, where's your baseline? How do you test that? <laughs> exactly. How do you perceive those? <laughs> the research also tells us that about a third of people will thrive. So they will yeah. go on and they'll say, well, this is the catalyst for me to do something different, yeah. to be more, to do more, etc." So when I say thrive, it's in relation to where they were before. It's, mm. it's not an absolute thrive. And then about a third will flail. And I use the word flail and nobody's fixed in any of those spaces because you can change yeah. along the way. But the, the people who flail really have those experiences of, of perhaps, you know, substance use. You know, we're four times more likely to use substances, alcohol, IV drugs, with a traumatic experience, uh, three times more likely to have employment problems, be depressed, be unemployed, or be on antidepressants, two and a half times more likely to smoke, um, the risk of homelessness. We know trauma, you know, particularly family and domestic violence, is the leading cause of homelessness, and 15 times more likely to suicide and and that third that flail mm. really need us as a community yeah. to give them a life ring 
you know, right. to, to so, help them. Yeah, you know, using a business term, that's your target market. Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, we, we can help people move up and get a better outcome if they want it, mm. but certainly we want, as a society, to stop people from flailing. Mm. And in that... Sorry? Yeah, so I, I was just going to say, what what is the target of Angel Hands and what you do? Yeah. Is it is it to move the <laughs> flailers into the middle group or into the thrive? Or, or is it because, I, I don't know, sometimes it's... It's that whole thing of, well, I don't want to be that, but mm -hmm. don't wanting mm -hmm. to be that will keep you in this perpetuating circle mm -hmm. as opposed to, I want to go over here. Mm -hmm. I think our... Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And at Angel Hands, you know, Carl Jung says, if I can do nothing but leave you as I found you, then I have succeeded. <laughs> you know, so certainly we'd like to do no harm and, yes. and leave people no worse off than With what... No footprints. Yeah, it? when they, they come to us. But ideally we want to work with people or walk beside people as they get what they want so yeah. you know it's it's easy for us to sit yeah. back and say you should be but people come to us and say I want to be mm. and so we help them work out what is the biggest struggle in their life and how can they develop strategies yes. and techniques to master that so it's you know we want everyone to be thriving Yes. obviously yes. but that those small increments of how they get to that space and and for a lot of people just to survive you know i say yes. to people just just to be getting up eating having a shower your hair, you know your exactly you know the basics in life and so the model that i've come up with and we rely heavily on is what we call the hope model so the right. first step in that is finding your inner hero Yes. You know, how do I find the courage, mm. you know, and hold that in one hand along with my fear and my terror yeah. and my heartache in the other because, yeah. boy, that's heavy. Yeah. And how do I hold those two things and not be paralyzed by what's happened? Yeah. How do I start to move? And, and Going so, back to Carl Jung, that's, you know, learn to love all of you. Your exactly. light side and your shadow. Exactly. And and so when you've you know, found that inner hero, and a lot of the time we have a lot of work to do around changing people's mindsets that once you start something you have to finish it. Mm. Because in this journey, if something's not working, you know, Albert Einstein says the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting <laughs> a different result. <laughs> yeah. So we say to people, it's okay to change. You know, we, yeah. we don't have to start what we finish. If it's not working for you, let's try something right. else. You know, obviously we don't give up at the first instance, but you, yeah. you've got to actually relearn a lot of those messages we got, you know, at school. Don't put your hand up if you don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, that's paralyzing. Nobody knows the answer to getting through this yeah. stuff. So, you know, yeah. so find your inner hero. And that's what we're here to help people, yes. you know, find. And to some extent, we're, we're the first aid hero. We're here to, to fly with you. Yes. Um, the second one is around getting the basics of life organized. You know, if we go to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah. you know, for, for so food the, and shelter. Sorry, ages for hero. I always for, always for organising the basics. Yeah. So, so you, Maslow's hierarchy of needs for food. Yeah, shelter, food, clothing. love and belonging. Yeah. And, and then that helps you to have a good sense of self-esteem, which helps you to get to your self-actualisation, your full potential, in yes. other words. And, and there's a model of that that changes those three um, first-mentioned things of love and belonging, safety, and food and shelter. And it changes them to a milking stool. So it really helps people to yeah. realise if you haven't got those things, if you don't feel safe, if yeah. you don't have a sense of love and belonging and you don't have access, you know, to to food and some way to live, you can't actually have a, a stable sense yeah. of self esteem. And any self actualization or any potential you've got can mm. be threatened at any moment. It can be wobbly. Imagine that stool. Yeah. So we help. It's people. interesting because I, I had a lady on the on the podcast who who suffered from um, postnatal depression, and mm -hmm. the biggest thing she talked about was having a community around her, a little tribe around her. And, and by there's this nasty thing whereby almost she, the more she came sadder, the more she needed it, but the more she shunned it away. And so that third, you know, she got the food, she got the house. Yep. Fine. But if you don't but feel the third part of the the milking stall wasn't present. A perfect example, and and instantly, if you change things to images, 
you can see how it can mm. happen so easily. And, yeah. and uh, that was by a guy called Anthony Taylor from New Zealand. He's an emeritus professor. I love yeah. that word emeritus. But uh, he, he sort of just redesigned it as a visual, which really, really we found helps people, yeah. A, to give themselves a break. Now I get why I feel so wobbly all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. And it also helps the rest of us to realise in what place are we? Are we putting a little wedge like the waiter does under the table? Yeah. And, and chocking up that milking stool? Or are we a professional who has to help redesign it and strengthen it and make yeah. it stable for the long term? Yes. So that, that sort of get those things organised and, yeah. and secure. And then you go on this pilgrimage. Right. So where so am you're I? you're a hero. You're including all of yourself. You've got your three pillars. Now you're off on a journey. Exactly. And how do I make meaning of this? How do I hold it? Mm. How do I hold all those contradictory messages about people being good and I need to trust people and yet somebody's betrayed me and, uh, you know, I just don't feel like I can trust anybody I don't know. You know, and in many cases, mm. imagine that the person's still walking around, the, the, the person responsible for your trauma hasn't been caught, nobody knows where they mm. are, you don't even know what they look like. Yes. So you're yeah. walking around in a world that isn't safe, that isn't predictable, where people aren't good and kind like we've been taught. Mm. So, you know, on that pilgrimage journey, you actually need to figure out all of those aspects. So it's not just what's the landscape that I'm on, but who are these people around me and how do I actually have meaningful relationships again with them? Yes. And... The last part of it is in order to be a pilgrim, you have to be an explorer and you have to ask yourself explorer. constantly, who, who am I? I've got to explore internally. And, yes. and uh, there are three so quotes. So is the pilgrimage more the outer world and the explorer is more of the inner world? For me, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Because like you, you know, you're trying to make meaning and it's about the purpose. So while we're making meaning, we're the pilgrim and we're making meaning of the place, the space the people but then an explorer has to have the right attitude yes you know so you as an explorer some of the greatest explorers of science of of landscapes and things a lot of their learning has been by accident yes you know so uh, the quotes that most people I talk to hang on to uh, you know and, and make a lot of uh, connection to uh, it matters not what happens to you in this world but what you do with what happens to you, that's a Chinese proverb. Yes. And once you can sort of start to think about it like that, well, I can't change what it, what is, yeah. you know, and what was, was, what is, is, and the only thing I can do is change what I do in the future in relation to it and yeah. how I use it. The second one <clears throat> um, is a problem is an opportunity and drag, you know. <laughs> Yes. We didn't want to be here. We didn't want this to happen. But yes. now it has. How can we use it? How can we, yeah. you know, leverage and learn and, and grow yeah. from it? And that sort of brings me to the third quote that I came up with in life. And that is is that, you know, it, we all talk about shit happens. Yeah. You know, it's a fabulous quote. We all love it. Well, if shit happens, you know, the shit we get through, get today, yeah. is the fertilizer that can help us to grow and blossom tomorrow. Oh. You know, Love that. Love and I, that. I laugh because we go down to Bunnings or you know yeah. the hardware store and we buy fertilizer. Shit. We pay good money for it, <laughs> yeah. and yet when life throws it at us, yeah. we often look away from it and goes, "No, nah, it stinks." Yeah. But if we actually add water yeah. and seek out light, then we can grow. Yeah. And uh, I like to think there's a correlation. You know, the scientist in me says there's a correlation between the size of the pile of poop and the potential to grow yeah you know the bigger the pile of poo the more fertilizer we've got but some people don't have access to water and they can't find the light so yes. they're the third that will flail and we need as a society to wrap our arms around them not yeah. judge them hmm. but help them to find a way to make meaning and and bring yeah. them towards the light and lend them some water you know on that journey in this journey how precarious is delving into things like why because why me i mean I, I watched a great little um interview with a guy called um mozambique who's an english guy that got put 
for no apparent reason, got pulled out of his life, but put into Guantanamo Bay just because he was Muslim, and then was deposited back three years later. And, and in the middle of it, he, he got he shifted from why me to why not me. Yes, yes. And and, and yeah, but still, why? Why is it me? Why did he do this? Why did she do that? Why did the, And then you start going into the world of mm-hmm. blame. Mm-hmm. And to me, that strikes as a, as a downward spiral. We want to know everything. We want to be in control. We want predictability mm-hmm. in our lives. Yet these circumstances demonstrate that you don't. Mm-hmm. I think a traumatic experience teaches you very quickly that the modernist belief that we can control things in life is a fallacy yes. um, so that and helping people to understand that and and that even like I say to people if you knew why you'd be capable of it, it particularly when it comes to crime if you knew why that person or how that person killed somebody you would if you could understand it you'd be capable of it so do you really want to understand yes, it because why, why do we need to know why yeah and this sort of tips on a question that I'm saving for a bit later for you um, it's kind of yeah. If you if you get to the actual knowing of why, then you've entered into the energy space. Exactly. And that's the best way I can describe mm. it. The energy mm. space that in, encapsulates the beliefs, the attitudes, the behaviours, the identity labels, everything around that. Uh, and then yeah, you're right. Mm. You then become capable of it. Absolutely. And and I say to people, you will <sighs> spend some time grappling with why. The question is, why not you? You know, and and I, I have a, a quote. She's I often, confronting. It is, it is. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I came up with it at some stage. I don't know when or, or in what context. I can't remember. But I say, I say to people, I'm not arrogant enough to think everything's about me, but I'm not arrogant enough to think nothing is either. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you know, you, you have to balance between what, what was my part or, or yeah. you know, why did this happen to me? But... But why wouldn't it have happened either? Because really, was it about you? Yeah. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why. Yes. We can't fix it. We can't change it. It, it matters about why when we're working in a preventative space. Yes. But when we're trying to recover people and help them to grow and, and move and carry. Yeah, recover people. Yeah, then it doesn't matter why. And, yeah. and a very wise lady once said, and I think I've mentioned it already, what was was, what is is, and what will be is up to you and me. Yeah. You know, we can yeah. negotiate that and, and we can influence it, but we can't control it. Yes. And when we let go of that need to control and understand why, then we can deal with what is. Yes. And we can we can build up our muscles, we can develop strategies and yes. you know somebody uh, on Facebook there's that thing about the professor that says it doesn't matter if your cup's half empty or half full if you have to hold a half cup of water on your hand it, it matters how long you have to hold it because your arm's going to get tired. Mm. So if we can help people to build up their muscles and learn when to put the cup down, when to pick it up you yes. know, do we even need this cup? Do we have to carry yeah. it or do we not? So I think that's that's the way I approach the why question yeah. with people. But people need to go through that part of their yeah. journey to get to a place where they can accept that knowing why yeah. may not be as productive as what they think. They have to get to that point, I mm. imagine. Otherwise, mm. it'll always be a lingering Exactly, why, exactly. Why, which will so. gnaw away at you. Because mm. it is... You know, you learn that if you're going to order a presentation, always try and answer the why question first because it's mm. the one everybody wants to know. <laughs> why, what, when. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Whereas I, I move away from that and, and sort of, you know, how, how do I say it to people? I'm trying to think. No, what have thoughts mm. fallen out the back of my head? So we have the hope model. model. Mm-hmm. Are there any other components to that? think so I, I think you know that that that's the yeah. framework and and how you unpack that and explore that with each different person yes you know is unique to what they need to understand on their journey yes um, and where they want to be going you know um, I say to people the first thing is 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 it a problem for you yeah you know because it could be a problem for the rest of the world but it might not be a problem for, for you. you and if not yeah 
you know. We're all cool. Yeah, and 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 I think that's part of giving control back because mm. trauma, as we talked about, shatters our belief in that we have any control, and and that the world is a safe and mm. predictable place where people are kind and benevolent and caring. Mm. Um, so the, there is a shadow side. There is, there is, and 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 that's in your face, you know, front mm. and center in a traumatic experience. So. If we can give people control of even what's a problem for them, mm. rather than writing it on them and telling them what's a problem, we yeah. ask them. And you know, um, when I work with first responders, I say, ask people where they want to talk. You wow. know, ask them where they want to yeah. talk. You know, we often see on the news they're standing at the front door. Well, you know, do you want to talk here or do you want to go somewhere more private? You know, yeah. would you? Would you like to sit down? Would you like to stand up? All those. Or go for a walk on the yeah. beach? Or do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Any of the things. Yep. So that first point, you can give somebody back choice and control. Yes. Then that's starting them on a trauma recovery journey instantly. Mm. Um, and if you ask people, well, what do you need in the early stages? A lot of people say, well, I don't know. I've been here. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. And you don't know. But you can turn that around and say, well, is there anything that you know you don't want or yes. you don't need at the moment to happen? And you can start by making, giving them control that those things they know they don't want to experience or, or be exposed to can be taken out of the picture. Yes. So a lot of... Sowing some little seeds very quickly. Yeah, and turning around questions, not, not um, always thinking with that, that sort of predictable hat. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, obviously, um, we, we talked about the trauma recovery side. There has been an increase in um, domestic violence and cases like this here in Western Australia. I mean, only last weekend we saw what happened to Edith Creel being shot by her husband. And um, as I said before, my daughter and I have been going and buying crystals from her for the last four years. Mm. So, you know, it kind of. It, it comes home. Mm -hmm. I didn't know her personally. Mm -hmm. Well, we knew her to talk to mm -hmm. her. But then all of a sudden you see somebody like, oh my God. Um, having just said, um, having just said, is there any benefit in going into the why question? Do you, do, is there any patterns here that we're seeing? Look, I, I think there's a couple of things. And, Behind, and the first why thing we I... we get to this point? Yeah. Um, the first thing I'd probably like to, to do, and I don't know why I feel the urge so strongly, but to say that Edith, like, um, it was her estranged husband, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so her estranged husband chose to shoot her. Yes. I don't know why, but the order in which we say things around this is really interesting. Right. Because we mention her first and then him. Like yes. it's his behaviour yes. that we need to be focusing on as a community around yeah. preventing it. Y yes, certainly in the context of the question that I'm now asking you. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I, I think, you know, our, our society is in a really interesting place in terms of gender and roles and all of that. And, and violence is violence. We look at the, the history of, what is it? I think it's 137 years since women stopped being chattels, you know, mm. and owned possessions of, of men, women and children. So if you think 137 years ago, I think it, it's, it's yeah. around that. I did a timeline recently. You know, don't quote me on that exact mm. number, but it's not that long. We look at 1970s was when no blame divorce came in. 1988, it was first recognised that domestic violence was a national problem. Yeah. I think it was in the 87 or something in one state in Australia, I think it might have been New South Wales, first introduced that you could charge, you know, a, a spouse so with, with a violent act against you. Uh, I think it was in the early 90s that rape of a partner, you know, a spouse became a criminal offence. So yeah. if you look at that context in which we've suddenly started, you know, I say suddenly, but we've we've started to call out criminal behaviours within mm. the context of an you know, intimate relationship, mm. we're, we're in a really new space. Yes. I think what we've seen since the early 90s, I don't think we've seen the domestic homicide rates as high since the early 90s. Yeah. Why? 
Yeah. I don't know. Because they... <clears throat> the raw numbers, you know, the statistician in me says per 100,000, what are they? Yeah. Because the raw numbers are similar, but our population has changed. Yes. And and the raw numbers are terrible. We don't want them yeah. being anywhere near so what is it, they are. Is it, a fun, is it a function of for every X amount of thousand people, this is likely to occur? And by mm. the very nature of the population's increased, therefore... It will the numbers are looking as a, bigger. As an unfortunate yeah. consequence. Yeah. Exactly. So, so mm. is the ratio of domestic violence increasing it is a question I think we have to be careful of. Yeah. I mean, the numbers are too high. One is too yeah. high. We should have none, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot more awareness of, you know, domestic violence Mm. which is violence, you know. Um, we also know that the covert forms of abuse that we don't always see, which contribute to domestic violence, is also... Um, what sort of things with those? So we see things like financial abuse, where people are denied access to finances, so therefore yeah. they don't have the resources to leave. You know, we're in, in conjunction with psychological abuse, put-downs, intimidation, harassment, yeah, you know, all, all yeah. of those sorts of name-calling, the, the gaslighting where, yeah. you know, you sort of say, well, that didn't really happen. So, you know, the victim begins to question their, their actual sanity even. Yes. Well, I'm sure that happened. I'm sure that's what you said. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, all of those things that we actually don't see as violent acts. You know, we see sexual assault as a violent act. We it, see a physical yeah, assault. Yeah, there's something... Observable. Yeah. I wouldn't say the word clean and obvious yeah. about it. Not that, not that it is, but it's yeah. there. Yeah, there's something really, really yeah. evidence-based that, not that's tangible. all these tons of little things that have been going on in the background. Exactly. And I think... You know, I and I say I think I've got no research, but you know, one possibility I've thought of is that there is a lot more awareness of domestic violence and those covert forms of abuse. So people are, you know, particularly victims are beginning to realise they are at in, at risk. So they're leaving more mm. than they perhaps used to. They might have stayed before, the so they're leaving a relationship, yeah. and we know. You know, most people think that the highest risk of being killed is when you are in a relationship and there's, you know, a fight or, you know, mm. a, a, there's an assault. But what we actually know from the research is the highest time uh, or the highest likelihood of being killed is actually once you've exited the relationship. Right. Because abuse is about power and control and the other person trying to use power to instill fear and then use that yeah. fear to control you. Which is... Which is sort of easy sets of behaviours to execute while you're in the closeness of a relationship. Mm -hmm. but then when somebody exits, then it's just been reversed. And then... And so the abuser feels like they've lost control. Yes. The more control they feel like they've lost, mm. the more they'll escalate their behaviours. So we see um, if we look at... And their at emotions will be running ragged at that. Absolutely. Because and a big part of what I was, I was thinking about this as preparing for the interview on both sides, um, a lot of this would be being able to navigate your own emotions and s sit with them. Absolutely. The, the idea of self-regulating and, mm. and making wise responses, and that's actually the thing I said I, I'd forgotten earlier, was around the language we use yes. around these things. So... You know, people will um, say that somebody who, you know, kills in the context of domestic violence, for example, in a domestic relationship, it's always, was he drunk? Did he have drugs? You know, I say he, because in many, many cases it is a he. Mm. Um, but, you know, were drugs involved? Were alcohol involved? Was there mental illness? You know, all, all these sort so of, you know, to. family court, you know, what, what was the cause and effect yeah. relationship? But what they don't realise is we're looking at someone who hasn't regained control. Yes. Is feeling totally lost. So they've gone through a period of promising it'll be different. They've gone through a period of threatening that if you don't come back and give me what I want, um, then, you know, I'm going to do something else. And yeah. then that moves to intimidation and actual harassment. And then that moves to actioning threats. 
ratchets, and ratchets, 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 yeah, ratchets up. Unless the victim returns to the relationship and then it starts in that cycle of abuse again. Yes. You know, where they go into a honeymoon phase and then a build-up phase and then the explosion and then the remorse and then, you know, back into the the honeymoon the, or the buyback phase but if the buyback phase doesn't no. work and they can't get the person back into the relationship and they exit that's when you're most likely to be killed as was the case with Edith yes and I, I don't like to talk about specific cases yeah per se because uh, the family of course may be listening so yeah apologies if, if yeah. anyone's distressed um by what I've said in that space, but there's a very observable pattern in the majority of, of experiences. So mm. if we know we're more likely to be killed and we exit, but we don't know that when that's our point where we're most likely to be killed, yeah. then often people breathe a sigh of relief and go, right, I'm out of it. Yeah. And they let their guard down. And that's, that's when they're the most vulnerable. It is. And yeah. society and who, doesn't know that. And also, who would want to believe that the person that they're with who they will still have feelings for, would go and do such a thing. Mm. Oh, definitely no one, you know, <laughs> wants to believe that, that people, you know, yeah. that we know would do that. Exactly. Let alone someone we loved. Yeah. You know, it is, it's quite a, it's quite a, um, a stretch and, and yet I talk about people who don't make wise problem solving. Yeah. So, no, they weren't mad. And mm. in most cases, they're very rational and very logical and they take all mm. very you know, calculated and planned steps to enact a plan to do these sorts of things. So they're yeah. not mad as in the no. Arnie Schwarzenegger or all revenge and, you know, yeah, yeah. that sort of thing. They're, they're actually... Red fury. They're, they're calculated, mm. they're meticulous. But there is something going on. Well, they're not making yeah. wise decisions. Choices, yeah. They're not making good choices about mm. what will solve this problem that they have. So, listen to this. And I'm going to be really transparent, having separated myself not so long ago, and, it, and that's not been tidy either. Um, there seems to be a real lack of examples and case studies and, and ways forwards for h how do you get on with your life when a significant pillar of that life, a relationship, mm -hmm. for however long time it has, and particularly when there's kids involved, because the kids will ratchet that emotional level up the next next bit and I've certainly been through the journey of right so I'm not going to be seeing my daughter every day mm. and I've got to be okay with that now yeah yep. it's a huge loss isn't it, it? yeah mm. yeah it is one that um, yeah you, you, I, I recognise it's, it's not easy but it's there mm -hmm. and I can't be where I was mm -hmm. and so all of that so yeah there just seems to be a complete lack in that space I agree. One of the things I have advocated for a long time is that we need healthy role models mm. in society. So all our news is full of these unhealthy relationships where people aren't using wise choices and, you know, they, they've not got a good, strong sense of self. Whereas if we actually started by getting rid of Romeo and Juliet and yep. all that romantic guff, guff yeah. <laughs> you know... They look across a room, they've got nothing in common, but, you know, gee, we want to shag, so let's get together. And, oh, now that can't be. We'll have to, you know, true love is about, you know, being yeah. that in love with someone, you have to kill yourself. So going back to those real deep messages well, yeah. that we get. And that's about, our archetypal message, that is. It is. And they're there from we're very young. I yeah. mean, and, and you'd like to think it's 2018, my goodness, that they've got to change. I, I was reading my niece's a story a few years ago, and it was the Princess Chronicles. Yeah. You know, I, get me a bucket, please. <laughs> because, you know, Beauty and the Beast have been married for 10 years now, and guess what? The Beast's decided to throw a ball. Now, A, it's his decision on his own. They didn't decide they wanted to have a party. Mm. He's made this unilateral decision. What does that tell girls and boys? She's worried about what she's going to wear. Brilliant. And they're going to be happy ever after again. What does that tell us? <laughs> yeah. How, how does that set us ready to deal, deal. with real life? 
Yeah. You know, because, you know, I'm telling you, I'm not going to a party you planned without me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so I think... I'm it... thinking about a little bit more than just what I'm wearing. <laughs> What I wear will be important, but there are other bits. A- absolutely. There's nothing wrong with wanting to look good. But what yeah. about celebrating the fact we've made it through the challenges? We've had some ups, we've had some downs, yeah. we've negotiated the problems. Yeah. You know, some couples even separate for a while and then get back together. You know, they work through stuff. But we don't hear about that. We mm. don't have social messaging about couples who separate successfully who negotiate family functions and all sit at the same table, you know, at Christmas and and do all of that stuff really well. We don't have messaging that tells us only about 8% of separating couples ever end up in the family court. Mm. Only 8%. Only 8%. And of those 8%, only a small portion go to trial. Right. So, and they're typically examples of relationships that weren't working well and weren't able to solve yeah. problems within In them. the first place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's almost going back to making good choices at the start. A- absolutely. Yeah, and I've been down that track as well, <laughs> as I'm sure you have. Um, yeah. Yeah, but we make choices based on what we're told. You know, when I first started seeing my, my husband, there were a couple of times things were shonky and people said, oh, you know, well, he, he loves you a lot. Look, he's done this. He's, he's following oh, yeah. you. He's always there, you know. Even when we separated and he went and left suicide notes, people were telling me I needed a psychologist because he loved me enough to kill my, to kill himself. Yeah. And uh, like, hello. <laughs> what about the notes? <laughs> exactly. Have you thought that he needs some help? Yeah. And we don't listen to men when they say they need help. Yes. And and I think we pat them on the back and we tell them there's plenty more fish in the sea. We have a, a stereotype that men make meaning of relationships through physicality and, and you know, sexual behaviours. Mm, that's not entirely true. I know it's yeah. not true, but if you think of men, it's like go and find someone else and, and you know, go be down. intimate with them and you'll feel better. Yeah. We actually don't acknowledge that deep sense of loss and hurt mm. that men go through. Mm. And and we don't teach boys. I mean, I've, I've got a, a young son now, mm. you know, very blessed, and I teach him a language to express his frustration and his anger and his happiness and his joy and his love. And, you know, we've got all these emotion words on the fridge and faces that he can point to. Mm. But people say, gee, your son's so expressive. And I'm thinking, well... Well, it's because you fed that. Yeah, but... And I share all these tools with other parents because yeah. they don't know about them. Mm. Interestingly, in, my, in the very last podcast, I was, I was talking with a lady about male and female energy. Mm. Not male and females. And how there is a degree and a percentage breakdown of, of, of their energy in both of us. Mm. Mm. and uh, the yin and the yang and the dots in the middle and stuff like that absolutely we're not all of anything and, no and I think back to loving all of us again coming on thank you very much absolutely <laughs> and and I think it's it's really important that we you know I, I did some um, work recently that talked about being in your best self and your shadow self mm. you know like we are diverse we do have you know what we call positive and negative emotions why is anger such a negative thing you know it, it's only negative if you make bad choices about what to do when you're feeling it mm. it's okay to be angry it's okay to be raging as long as your behavior isn't directed at people mm. or, or hurting anyone but we reject that stuff so i think we've got a lot of work yeah because there's a certain um um Anger in and of itself can be actually quite constructive because it will move you from apathy mm. into another place. Mm. It can propel you. Yeah, it can propel you forward. Absolutely. And, and, and then from there you move on to acceptance. Um, yeah. Mm. And uh, yes, yeah, so, but it's doing something constructive with that. Yeah. And I remind people it's fine to be angry, but just remember it's one letter off danger. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I don't know where I read it, but I love it. I use it all the time. (laughs) So, um, what does the next, um, what does the next sort of three to five years look like for yourself? Well, you know, I'd love to say that because uh, there's there's a part of me. uh, I was thinking this as well beforehand, and you know, you talk about being in the. uh, We said earlier on, if you if you were to ask the question why and enter the energy space, then you could be capable of doing it yourself. 
with that sort of in mind, with you yourself, I, I appreciate that you know you've had this experience and you want to share your learnings and move people forwards, etc. But is there a part of and that needs to move to another energy space in, in the future. Does that make sense? It, it does. Otherwise I, you'll be the lady that. Yeah, <laughs> look, I think, I think I'm at a point in my life where I'm now a person who's had an experience, but that experience doesn't define everything about me. I yeah. think that's nice. Like there's this personal part of me and, and a personal part of my journey people recognize, yeah. but then there's this political and professional part that I've had and I've got this, this yeah. new personal space uh, I love, I absolutely thrive on opening people's minds to the possibilities you yes. know, of life that we yes. can we can really um, attempt anything in this world if, if we want to mm. uh, we obviously need to access resources and, and have time and, and when I say resources not just money it needs to be time it needs to be energy it needs to be skills to help us do it but we can actually you know tackle anything that we really want in this world and for me I love motivating people. That's, mm. you know, I'd love to be traveling the world. Motivating doing, them to do what? Whatever it is they want to do. Yeah. You know, to being what they want to be and who they mm. want to be and how they want to be in the world. Obviously, so long as they're not hurting themselves or someone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the only preface I ever put on anything. Yeah. But just a lot of people don't realize that that you can change your mind. You can yeah. change direction. I mean, the, the opportunity in my problem was that I... I had this whole other world open up to me. Yeah. You know, I've travelled the world, I've I've seen, done, studied, met people, talked to yeah. people I would never ever talk to had it not been for this experience, you yes. know, because it gave me a voice and a credibility that I built on, you know, it didn't it in itself just didn't mean all that stuff happened. Yeah. I had to learn more, I had to massage my message i had to figure out why i even wanted to be going on this pathway so i could be clear about it for other people yeah but you know it, it, it's possible to do what you would like to do in this life you know being told you were a dummy at school or marrying early you know having kids late none of it defines who you are you define that mm. on a daily basis yes and that's at an identity level Absolutely, and and that can open up worlds to you if you open up your mind and say that's what I want to be. Yeah, so, I'm not just this and this and this yeah, and this and this. I'm, you know, I'm more than the sum of my parts. I'm, yeah, you know. This, so do you see the next three to five years? You doing more of getting that part of the message out? I certainly would like to do a lot more of that motivational speaking, that that sort of educational workshop stuff. Mm. I, I'd like to see Angel Hands, you know, secure financially and, mm. and operating without me, you know, as, as much as I am involved. I'm not yeah. involved at the same level I used to be. But I'd, I'd really like to just keep working towards a world where we see people. We mm. don't see problems, we see people. And we see people who we can... Um, I guess support and walk beside and upskill as they seek to be the people they want to be. Awesome. Hmm. How um, how do you keep yourself grounded in all of this? What do you do to for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, I I, I love uh, I love being out on our property. We've got yeah. a little property. I like uh, I, I make all sorts of preserves and things you know from yeah. from the produce we grow and and are given and then i sell that to raise money for angel hands um, yeah. <laughs> because it's too much for us to eat and i've been yeah. out of the house um but yeah i just i just you know movies cooking being in nature um, yeah. hanging out with family and friends it's beautiful so just the everyday things and having a really dark sense of humor yeah <laughs> i can only totally imagine <laughs> that's one of the things I was going to ask actually and well you've kind of answered it for me is because I just like these random questions turn up mm -hmm. um, was one of them is do you ever just not taking anything away from what's happened mm. but do you ever just laugh at it oh god yeah it was the yeah. first thing I did so the first thing I said mm. to the nurses was he shot the wrong leg 
and they just looked with this look of horror on their face and I said well the other one didn't have any varicose veins like that <laughs> you know that one that he took oh, had, was, had no varicose anybody's had babies or no this yeah. and, and the other one's full of them so I would have r- much rather it the other way around yeah yeah you know <laughs> would have been easier to yeah. drive a manual car as well you yes. know there's a few reasons but yeah, yeah I, I started laughing and, and you you know I'd never laugh about what happened but I laugh yeah, at that's what aspects I meant. of what happened. Yeah. And I, I just it was a question make... that sort of just came up from here, and I thought, how do I do this yeah. delicately? No, <laughs> no, I, I say it as it is. And I, yeah. I think, you know, my whole, you know, I talk to people about setting realistic goals in the first place. So my first goal on my recovery journey was to find something to laugh about every day. Yes. Yeah, that it was as simple as that, and it didn't have to be a good belly laugh. Just to, <laughs> at, yeah. at first, it was as much as that, because as you can imagine, <laughs> you know, I, I use the analogy of storm clouds. You know, when something mm. like this happens, this the the sky is black. There's thunderbolts. Yeah. There's not a, a skerrick of blue. Yeah. So if you can just find that bit of blue and and laugh and and see a, a glimpse, yeah. you know, eventually those clouds will pass. Yeah. It takes a while, but yeah, for me the the way to chase them away was a, a little laugh and then a bigger laugh and, you know, then uh, a lot of dancing and music and yeah, uh, night clubbing I think had a little bit to do with it. Not for the drinking part, but just, just for the, the dancing and dance, music. Yeah. So it's it's the mindfulness stuff. Yeah. It's Putting a, yourself and doing things that yeah, you know will. Yeah. And taking the piss out of everything, you know. <laughs> Life is so serious and, and serious shit Ridic- happens. Ridiculous, let's say. <laughs> it is. It is. But if you're just in the moment, you know, tomorrow will take care of itself. You can plan. You can do all this. Yeah, or yeah. You can spend 50,000 hours of energy trying to make it perfect. But it's going to be what it's going to be. Yeah. And you can't control everything, you as can. you found. Absolutely. And why would I want to? It's just so bloody tiring. Yeah. But having said that, there was a period in my life I was quite a control freak. Right. Because I needed to. Yes. And and that's normal as well. So anyone mm. out there listening, don't think that I'm saying you should oh, You're a yeah, yeah, exactly. Indeed. Yeah, there's skills we learn. Mm. How to let go. Well, the last questions I want to ask you, and ask many of my guests this is if you could take a little nugget nugget of information and upload it into the collective consciousness so everybody gets it what would that be oh goodness me um i guess don't do for me be with me say that again don't do for me be with me do you want to expand on that <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we live in this this world of busyness, of hurriedness, oh, yeah. of of consumerism, of giving, of doing, you know. But the most precious thing anybody can do is just be with you in that moment, in whatever it is you're doing. You know, you sit on a park bench waiting for a bus. Just being there with a total stranger, it's a beautiful gift, you know. Just, just be. Yeah. Um, the doing will happen, the busyness will happen, but just learn to be with people, appreciate them, that that mindful moment of right here, right now I'm with you and we've been doing this interview and the 10,000 things I have to do afterwards and the, the things that have happened before you got here, they don't matter, we're just here. Yeah. And that's the most precious gift we can give ourselves or anyone else. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And as you explained it, yeah, that, that's very much what I get from doing these podcasts. Opportunity, yeah. everything else just stands still, and I get to be with someone for a while. Yeah, and I, I think you know, have you seen the movie Trolls? Yes. Yeah, you know that concept that happiness is something we can consume. If you just be, you'll notice it's already there. Yes. Mm. Indeed. And it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. If people wanted to reach out to you, where will they find you? Uh, there's through Angel Hands, www.angelhands.org for organisation, yep. dot au. Yep. Uh, or they can Google me and there's anneoneal.com and that's Anne without an E. Yes. And uh, yeah, they'll, they'll find me on any number of social media and I'll eventually find the right message to respond to <laughs> with all those different forums. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure oh. talking to you today. Uh, it's been fascinating to hear just a, the wealth of reflection on your journey and the things that you've learned and then how you've put that back out to serve 
others it's mm. phenomenal oh, well thank you and and uh, i hope that you and your listeners have a, a lovely journey of life where they can just be thank you mm. thank you i feel like i want to shake your <laughs> yeah, hand <that's... laughs> oh you know we got a hug <clears throat>